We're here on site for an off-grid solar installation that we did about four months ago and um, we are revisiting it for the first time. We forgot to do any filming the first time around. So we're here, We've got a couple friends joining us as well for this. <laughs> so yeah, just gonna walk you through the system and I guess we're starting outside the solar panels because that's where everything begins. We've gotten away with using four total panels, around 1400 watts to serve two 25 foot diameter yurts and a laundry shed, tool shed, future bathhouse zone. Um, so most single family residences are looking at somewhere between 2,500 and 5,000 watts. Um, and the reason we were able to get away with such a small system is we took some notes from the RV and van, van life crowd. Um, most off-grid homes are still wired and uh, kitted out for a grid connection, even though they're off-grid. And thus all of the power produced at the solar panels is then immediately inverted. And then it eventually makes its way through the wiring. And in our current day and age, it's then often converted back to DC, which is what the solar panels produce. They produce DC energy. So um, 30, 40 years ago when off-grid battery systems started becoming a thing, Everything was still mostly AC. It was a off or AC refrigerators, washing machines, dryers, all of the stuff. Now we live in computer land, um, device land, LED land, all of which runs off of DC. And despite that, most off-grid setups are still converting from DC at the solar panel and at the batteries to AC and then converted back to DC. And all of that creates efficiency losses, sometimes totaling up to 50% or more for the system. So for this system, we cut out the two middle people um, and we went straight DC to a DC battery bank, of course. And then everywhere we could in the laundry shed and in the yurts, we selected DC appliances. Um, and those can be found most readily in the van life and RV crowd uh, because they can't really afford to be carrying around extra batteries and solar panels and all that. So um, yeah, it's 14, around 1400 watts. I think these are each 370 watt panels. They're obviously utilizing some other great tools to minimize their solar footprint yes. uh, or their electrical energy footprint like this amazing sun catcher <laughs> clothes dryer <laughs> so um yeah let's head into the power center shed is i think what we're calling it and check out what's actually happening inside all right this was a absolute mess of a construction site last time we were here so this is looking good. Yeah, looks kind of like a laundry shed slash tool shed. All right, Wes, please explain your genius to us. <laughs> and what the heck is happening in this corner? Yeah, um, well, it's not quite as spiffy as some of the prefabbed, you know, off the shelf off grid systems, but we were able to save a lot of money through the savings of panels and batteries and everything by doing it this way. So um, sun's coming in. This is the charge controller. Uh, basically regulating how much voltage and current is going to the batteries. Um, we've got a breaker from the panels and from the charge controller. That's then going to our battery bank here. This is a 48 volt bank, so there's eight. there are eight batteries tied in series. So um, these are six volt batteries. I think this is this is a 480 amp hour battery bank at 48 volts or somewhere right around there. I remember that, sounds about right. So, somewhere right around there. So um, from the battery bank, we are then going again through breakers everywhere, um, straight to a 1500 watt slash 3000 watt peak inverter. This is a pure sine wave, wave inverter in case they want to run or do, do any charging in here, definitely for the washing machine, which they have right there. Uh, you can see that's plugged in um, 
and a few other things. And this is a cool inverter. It's got some low power draw features. So if it's not sensing a load, it automatically drops down to a lower power draw. Um, also branching off from the battery bank, we have, or branching into the battery bank, should I say, this is a um, AC to DC converter. So if their battery bank is running low, it's been raining for days on end. I think we size this at peak loads uh, for three to four days of power. Three days, yeah. Three days of power without having to get any supplemental charging. So, but if they do need to, there are some features in the yurts that will let them know it's time to charge, mainly low voltage disconnects, so all their lights will shut off. Um, and they just bring in a portable generator, plug this in. They could also hook this up to a, um, uh, what's it called, an auto gen start. So it'll mm -hmm. automatically fire up the generator if it senses too low of a voltage. So basically that's their way if it's super rainy, long cloudy week, they're not getting enough juice, they can either run a generator or hook up to some other, some other sort of power and charge the bank. Exactly. Cool. So if the sun's, yeah, just not, not putting out enough, they can supplementally charge this with gas or propane or diesel, depending cool. on what generator they have. And there are safety features in this inverter. You can set a low voltage disconnect and at each of the yurts. So if the battery bank reaches a critically low voltage, everything just shuts off and you can't do anything unless you come out and charge it. So nice. there are all sorts of fancy features, including this auto gen start that they could tap into, but um, they've elected not to and their yurts are 100 feet away. Yes. So they can just simply walk over. You've done a great job of designing in many options into this <laughs> system for the future. So yeah, yeah, very flexible, can to. adapt with them as they change and grow. And then the last piece of this, so they've got the power for the, um, the laundry shed. They also have a, a um, this is a 48 volt to 12 volt converter. So they have 12 volt DC right here. So you can see they have um, some plugs, a 12 volt plug, um, this voltage gauge. And then at each of these breakers right here, you can see we've got one for each of the yurts. So this is going straight DC, 48 volt DC. It's going through the wiring and it's actually run underground to each yurt. So each yurt is being supplied 48 volt DC. And again, that's to eliminate efficiency losses because almost everything in the yurts, if not everything, is DC. And we were able to do this because the run between the yurt and the laundry shed was short enough this is a big problem with DC versus AC. The voltages on DC are, are much lower than AC, so you typically need a thicker gauge wire, uh, a lower gauge wire, to accommodate the increased current. Lower voltage, higher current. So we have, I think, eight and six gauge wire run to each of the yurts, depending on which one and the, their location. So mm -hmm. let's cruise out to the yurt and check out what's happening over there. Cool. Still in Get construction here. <laughs> okay, so this is at each yurt, we have a yurt power center, I think is what we called this. Um, so the 48 volt DC from the battery bank is run straight to this. So opening this up, 48 volts coming in. We have this going to straight to an inverter. So this is, again, we tried to minimize we try to maximize all of the DC appliances in there. So we have LED DC lighting. Uh, we have DC, what else? Everything is DC. The DC like refrigerator. DC USB blenders, right? Like yeah, 12 volt cool DC stuff. plugs throughout the year. DC, uh, USB plugs that are going straight from DC. DC blender, DC refrigerator, DC lighting. The only thing we really thought might need AC is if, um, a friend came over with a computer. We even have Apple or whatever computer they have uh, DC to DC converters because laptops and computers run off of DC as well. So this was just in case somebody comes over with something that's running off AC. So we got away with a 375 watt inverter for each year. Um, so from the 48 volts coming in, we're going straight to the 375 watt inverter. And then we're branching up to, this is our low voltage disconnect. So 
you can, there are some options. Uh, this is a 48 volt low voltage disconnect. So you can change the setting depending on what batteries you have. If it's a lead acid or an AGM, you can change the setting for when this will shut off power to the DC appliances because this has a built-in disconnect. If the voltage coming in gets too low, it'll just shut off. With DC appliances running straight off a of battery, it typically does not. So we have a low voltage disconnect in case something happens, it's cloudy, it's just draining too much juice it will cut off power to the rest of this. And the rest of this is a 48 volt to 24 volt converter because we found a refrigerator that'll run off of 24 volts. We found USB plugs, um, blenders, all, all the stuff in here was able to, we found to run off of 12 volts, or I'm sorry, 24 volts. So this allows us to get away with some higher gauge smaller diameter wiring it's just cheaper uh higher voltage lower current so low voltage disconnect 48 volts in low voltage disconnect 48 to 24 volt converter and then our dc distribution block with the various fuses and this goes out to they don't have actually the yurt fully wired yet but um you can see we threw in real quick just a USB plug so they could charge battery packs, phones, while they are finishing the design of the yurt interior. But then they have plenty of space in here to run their w wiring to lighting, refrigerator, kitchen zone, plugs, whatever it is. Awesome. From this, it's just low voltage wiring going to each of the various circuits. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I think that sums it up yeah so it's meant to be somewhat simple it is it sounded complicated <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> describing all of that but it is meant to be somewhat simple uh, we were able to get away with again a much smaller system 1400 watts total for both yurts and the laundry shed and the whole setup came out to what I estimated to be half of what a prefab just kit off the shelf shelf would be. Yeah. We're talking savings of like ten thousand or more dollars. Yeah, for a yeah. single family or a dual family, even dual family residences. So I might add too that that is due in large part to Wes's insistence that before even beginning any sort of nuts and bolts design, they went through a very detailed needs and functions analysis of what do we really need inside these yurts to live the kind of life we want and once we had that criteria we designed from that that's why we were able to scale this system as you just saw yep so good design mate yeah <laughs> starting from the the needs and yes. it uh it took some prodding to work through that process but i think it really paid off um definitely in cost savings, also recurring savings, mm -hmm. replacing the batteries after 10 years. Now they have to replace only eight batteries instead of 16, which was, I called a, a kind of prefab off the shelf off grid kit supplier and they spec'd out 16 batteries. Um, so that's $3,000 in every 10 years in itself. Um, and yeah, they have a system that is designed to meet their specific context, their specific needs out here. Mm -hmm. And um, it's designed to be simple, low maintenance, all those, all the good things. Cool. And this, er, er, the other piece here is that everything that could also not be electric or run off electricity is designed to run off of electricity. So propane, water heater, um, eventually maybe running off of biogas or something like that. Mm -hmm. Again, the, the clothes dryer, minimizing the need to produce electricity then has this whole host of other savings, including system sizing, maintenance costs, and all these other things. So um, they've got all sorts of other fun stuff here, like a biogas digester, which is running their stove. And yeah, it's a more more fun things that will be we'll discussed have, on this we'll media channel We'll have more cool stories to come from Gomez Family Farm. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Any questions? What was the process uh, to assess the needs and wants? That sounds like a poking and prodding is that hard you have to meditate yeah <laughs> um yeah it's it definitely is just a bit counterintuitive you know here it's we 
in our modern culture, we have an, an AC grid connection. We have our sub panel and it's just, you just get whatever you see on the shelf. Um, but when you're designing for an off-grid system, the more intelligently you can design it, the more you can minimize your needs and figure out like what, what do I actually require here? The smaller the system can be again. So it definitely took sitting down in advance before even these panels were put up and what sorts of functions do I need to fill in this space? Do I, how many people do I need to cook for? How many loads of laundry do we need to do? Or do we anticipate having to do on the biggest day during the coldest and least sunny part of the year? Um, how often are we going to run the lights? How many lights as opposed to just off the shelf? How big is your building? You need a four kilowatt system, put it in, and then let's see where we go from there. So, uh, it's, The spreadsheets got real for this project. Yeah, but, it's good. <laughs> but they're all templated out now yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and ready to share. Um, but yeah, it's, I, it's a fun process and I think the clients enjoyed it once they got into it and it's like, mm -hmm. okay, we really get to design this from a functions perspective as opposed to from just plopping elements it in. First elements first, yeah. yeah. How do I get my hands on those templates? <laughs> <laughs> you got to know somebody. <laughs> or you got to we'll pay see, some money. We'll see if we can butter up Wes to put the links in the description of this video. So check yeah. there. You'll know if he said yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there, do you generally apply a percent buffer? So if you come out with a number, right, of what your electrical demand is, do you recommend a 5%, 10%, 20% electrical uh, needs buffer for the unforeseen stuff or did you just kind of shoot for that exact demand? Yeah, that's a good question. So we designed for the least sunny day of the year and we designed for the absolute peak anticipated usage that they could possibly do on that day of the year. <laughs> so that is kind of our built-in buffer and I designed it to have at least three days of storage without any supplemental charging from a generator or anything like that so again three days of storage at like max use in worse conditions was kind of the baseline okay. design yeah. yeah cool sweet anything else <laughs> you got to say something cool and then we roll the outro credits yeah which it's got to be inspiring and like 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 think like anchorman <laughs> what did anchorman say you could say stay frost stay classy <laughs> stay classy san diego something cool Roll in credits. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you told me to say, right? <laughs> no, no, this is 7th Gen signing off here at the Gomez Family Ranch. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.